I'm really honored to have David come today, uh, blessing us and sharing what's on his heart. Um, let's just pray and uh, before David speaks, just to ask, ask the Lord's blessing. Lord Jesus, thank you, God. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for just opening this place to us. Thank you, Lord, for letting St. James uh, allow us to come here today and to gather together and to worship you and to hear, Lord, from your word, from your heart. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, would you just let your Holy Spirit rest in this place? Would you soften our hearts, God, to hear your voice, Lord? Whatever you have to teach us, God, whatever you have to say to us, Lord, let us say yes. Let us say yes to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I just ask your anointing and your blessing now on David as he comes and shares in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's a mutual respect organization here. Keith, Keith inspires me more than he knows, so that's cool. Um, wow, it's good to be here. We were chatting a little bit earlier. It's like you can, you know, several of us in this room have been involved in various and sundry gatherings with various themes and all different sorts of angles of approaching Christianity and stuff. But this is probably about the least attended theme you could ever like do, but we've just got used to it. So it's sort of like, it's kind of funny. But anyway, it's just sort of the, the, the typical thing. If we did it like on prophetic worship or some, you know, big thing or something, intergalactic apostolic church planting or something, we'd have like, you know, we'd have to rent the LA Coliseum. But, you know, here we are. But this is good, isn't it? So I'm just really, I'm really glad to be here. It's kind of a weird it only hit me as I was uh, just standing out in the back. There was a weird collision of, of scheduling things going on. I mean, Keith asked, uh, has been planning this day for like quite a, quite a long time. And we talked way back initially. And, you know, is it a think tank? Is it more of a, you know, just all the different ideas of, of just moving back and forth. And I've just been totally committed to being here today. And I got invited to lead worship and do some sharing um, at one of the large gatherings that's going on right now in Los Angeles around the whole 100-year anniversary of, of Azusa Street and all that. Is that like now? Well, there's some this weekend, like some precursor stuff. And Tuesday's the actual anniversary. And then there's all this crazy stuff going on. So it's like sold out, no tickets left, you know, that kind of thing. And um, they said, you know, they, they asked me to come on April 14th. And which was Good Friday. And we thought, well, that's a little early, but maybe it's like a thing. And, you know, we double-checked like three or four times. Are you sure that's the right day? Yeah, so I was booked for that whole day, and uh, it, was, it was just their error. So they called a couple weeks ago, and they said, oh, we feel so bad, but all the pu published, you know, stuff's published, this, that, this, and so. We need you to come on the 22nd of April. That's the day we, like, we're supposed to, like, have, have asked you to come. I was like, I can't do it. They're like, no way, you don't understand. You know, it's like thousands of people and blah, blah, this, that, this, you know, and we're going to like, I said, I'm committed. Like, I'm down in Orange County and I'm, you know, down there with some friends and, and this has been in the works for a long time. So I'm kind of happy I'm here. It's kind of cool. Like, I just think it's this weird picture in some ways. I mean, not that the other gathering, it's probably really great and, uh, you know, it's sort of this, but it's sort of, it's funny to me that, you know, we're packing the L.A. Coliseum next week and, and some other gathering places and stuff, longing for the glory and the power of God to fall again, as it were. But there's something about the simplicity of what we're engaging in today that is stepping right into the, into the place of glory. I mean, I'm, I'm really serious about that. And uh, actually, I wasn't going to talk about that at all, but I'll start with a few thoughts on that because I think that's cool. And while I'm doing that, you can go to Mark chapter 10 and... You know, any questions, any, you know, stuff like that is fair. This session goes till 10. Okay. One of the craziest things, have you heard of this, 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 I mean, I would love to have met this guy. There's, there was a man named Isaiah who lived quite a few thousand years ago, or no, probably like, I don't know, two and a half thousand years ago, something like that. So I haven't had the chance to meet him. Bad joke. No, I'm just touching it. It's okay. Can I touch your computer? It's all right. Okay, thank you. So, um, but he, he got into the head and the mind of God in a way that is, is quite staggering. And I don't, it wasn't his intention, I don't think. He was one of these people, like many of us in this room, who were just ambushed by God. You ever been sort of in that 
kind of in that headspace. You go, how the heck did I get in the middle of this? It's sort of, but Isaiah stood from a prophetic vantage point that, of course, doesn't supersede any of the other prophets or any of, of the other biblical perspective that we have. But there are things that resonate in the heart of Isaiah and for some reason in the divine strategies of God as he stepped into the panorama of vision that the Lord was unlocking inside of him, which weren't words just for his generation. I mean, here we are over 2,000 years later and the words are ringing true today. But Isaiah fascinates me because he's the person that Jesus Christ quoted the most. So there's something about his vantage point, and he speaks a lot about the messianic uh, coming. He speaks a lot about the messianic mission. He speaks a lot about those kinds of things, which if, again, obviously why I'm going here, if you scratch, you don't even actually have to scratch under the surface, just full on in your face are the themes of justice and of mercy and of reconciliation and the power of God coming. But Isaiah makes this stunning proclamation. And what he says is he says that there is going to come a time when the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Those of you that are, are, are good old Messiah fans, you know, at Christmas time, what's, what's the next part? The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it. This is like staggering. In fact, this is bordering on heresy. Because every Jewish person has known ever since they could walk and talk and have any kind of intellectual comprehension, another biblical verse which says this, no man can see God and live. So there seems to be a contradiction going in here in the prophetic message. No, God will reveal himself. His glory will be revealed. Every single person on the earth is going to see it. But there's this, you know, confusing piece. Well, you can't see God and live. So, so what is this? It's a fascinating Hebraic sort of teaser. And what happens in the book of Isaiah, and in just in a purely literary sense, the climax of the book, you know, the plot thickens, every book has a climax. The climax in Hebraic literature structure of the prophet Isaiah is Isaiah chapter 53. It is the culmination of the prophetic word that the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed. It's the culmination of the prophetic word that says, don't weep anymore, Jerusalem. Your warfare will be accomplished. Your sins will be paid for. You will be released from captivity. Your tears will be wiped away. I mean, it's this powerful, powerful message. Remember all that kind of stuff? Well, Isaiah 53 is the climax. Here it comes. Here comes the glory. Here comes the presence of God. Here comes the breaking in of his kingdom. Here comes what you've all been longing for and waiting for. Here's what you've been singing about and chanting about and praying about as you wait in your gatherings and cry out for the presence of God to come. Here it comes. But it's fascinating because right at the beginning of Isaiah 53, Isaiah puts a disclaimer. You're not going to believe it. Do you remember that? Who's going to believe this message? Nobody's, and I'm going to add this word, but I think it's fair to the text. Nobody's going to want to believe this report. Here comes the presence of God. Here it comes. Here comes the glory. Here comes the download. Here comes the inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven. Here it comes. It's here. Lift your eyes to the horizon. Look. What? Huh. It's a man. Despised and rejected. A man of sorrows. Isaiah paints this picture looking way into the future. He says, his face is so marred. His physical appearance is so beaten, it is beyond human recognition. Here's the glory. Nothing in Isaiah 53, nothing in his appearance that would attract us to him. Well, I thought Jesus looked, kind of looked like Brad Pitt. You know, or I think, I, I, thought, he, I thought he had like, like he had this magnanimous ministry. 
And why he had the crowds is because he was such a good orator and he, he was handsome and he could like really captivate an audience. Isaiah says, no, 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 complete opposite. There was nothing in his charisma. There was nothing in his humanity and in his human makeup that would attract crowds to him. What was it? It's what we're talking about today. That's what I believe. At best, and this isn't a negative statement, but it might sound like it. At best, when we read through the scholars and the intellects and the theologians and we sift through the historic documents and we, you know, kind of rattle the New Testament down and just kind of let the dust come to the bottom, Jesus had about 500 followers when he died. Why? He had a lot of crowds. He ran some pretty massive conferences, but he had 500 followers. What does that mean? No one's going to believe this message. Nobody's going to want to believe this report. Where does he take us? He takes us to the poor. He takes us to the broken. And at least my little journey, and I've, you know, this is a lifelong thing, and that's what I so appreciate about Keith and Paul and different ones. I've, we're just turning our face to a, to a direction. We're just trying to keep pace with Jesus and walk in his way and figure out how he moves about the cities and the villages and the cultures of the earth and, and find out where his path takes us. And it takes us to the very heart of the issues that we're trying to wrestle with today. And I know many of you are probably in this room because you're already wrestling with it. I, I, I would assume that. I mean, maybe some of you, it's first kind of conceptual thinking. But um, so that's just kind of a little thought on the glory thing, you know. So nothing, you know, and, and I mean, I love it. I mean, I've written some songs and I've preached messages and, I've, and I pray out in the prayer room, you know, almost on a daily basis for the glory of the Lord to come. I know there is this, there is this download kind of thing. But the reality is this. If you're dry, if you want to find Jesus, if you want to meet him, Go out on this, you know, on these things this afternoon. I mean, seriously. If you want to see his face, if you want to interact with his heart, there's something, and here's the key question, and if you've heard me speak about this kind of stuff before, this is usually the musing that I just try to throw in the air. What we're trying to wrestle with is how central is this theme to understanding the kingdom of God and the call of Jesus Christ on our lives? Is it a side issue? Is it something that only certain people are gifted for? Is it something that is an outreach? Is it something that's a ministry that the church does? Or is there something in the very heart of wrestling with mercy and justice, it's interfacing with the expression of worship and the lifestyle of being a follower of Christ. Is it at the core of Christianity or is it one of the many things that we do? Is it a program? Is it optional? Is it, this is a very serious, serious question. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Does this advantage, and I'm not trying to convince you that it is, or I guess I am trying to convince you that it is, but you've got to figure this out for yourself because there's nothing worse than running down a trail because someone else has told you to do something and you didn't take the time. I love Hebrews. I mean, there's, there's this great little verse in Hebrews that I think the modern church and, and you know, over the last decades, we've been so poor at. The, the writer of Hebrews instructs its readers to just go and work out your salvation. Like, stop asking me questions right now. You know, just stop sitting there. Just go and work this thing out. And I don't know about you, but I've met so many people, particularly in the last five to ten years, who hit a time of life in their 30s and 40s in particular, it seems to be, who've grown up in church, who've been exposed to a measure of Christianity. Maybe they've got saved later on in their teens or in their early 20s, but they never worked out their salvation. Do you know what I'm talking about? And the hard issues of life come or the questions hit their head or their heart, the deep musings, the doubts that all of us have to wrestle through hit like way down the road and a meeting just won't cut it anymore and the bottom drops out of everything. You know people like that? Probably most of us in this room might be like that. I don't know, but it's like, it's a reality. 
And so we need to create space and create environments where we can work out our salvation. My oldest daughter, I don't think she'll mind me saying this. I hope not. I've, I've, I've done it before and she was cool. But, you know, she's, she's almost 20 now. And I'm so glad. I mean, she, of all our kids, she has wrestled the most with what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And she hasn't, like, gone way off in the ball rushes or, you know, then, but... But it's, you know, it's, the, it's the, one of the hardest things as a father, as someone who's a pastor, someone who's, you know, you're responsible for moving people along in the journey of faith to step back and go, you need room to ask the hardest questions possible. You need space in your spiritual journey to, to doubt, like, you know, and to, and to, and to gra- try to grasp with the things of, of life and what it means. And I'm, I'm so grateful that she's going through all this now. And, I mean, she's a follower of Jesus, and it's very, very clear. But I'm so glad she's going through this now. We didn't, like, just, you know, kind of ram her into some kind of little box and kind of make her sort everything out. Or, or here's the worst one. Here's just a little rabbit trail. Those of you, if you pray for people that are carry any kind of responsibility in the, in the life of the church... That, that is just brutal on children. Not so much because of people's expectations, but because of my expectations. Because if you don't turn out a certain way, that might mean my ministry is void. If you don't behave a certain way, that might mean that, you know, I'll get in trouble with the board. Or I won't look so good. Or I won't be that impressive. Do you, do you understand that kind of... That's really bad, bad Bad karma. No, that was the wrong thing to say. That's, 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 that's a really bad vibe. I mean, that's horrible. And I don't know how many times I've had to just hold myself. But at one time, I'm in this meeting. I don't know why I'm telling all this stuff. It'll just help you get to know me a little bit more. I'm in this meeting several years ago. My son, Josiah, he totally disobeyed me, and he's now 5'9", and has no you know, signs of stopping. I totally forbade him to get taller than me, but he's completely rebellious and has you know, gone way up there. Just ran the L.A. Marathon in four hours at 14 years old, so he's, he's, just, he's a crazy man. But anyway... I was doing this meeting. He's probably like about three years old. I'm in the middle of my message, and I kid you not, it's in a conference setting. It's not even in our own church. It's like all strangers, everything. And I see this motion, and he is cartwheeling like through the entire meeting, like right down the aisles, like through the middle, and there's just like legs, hands, legs, hands, legs, hands, legs, hands. It's just kind of going all the way across, and it took everything inside of me. And I, all of a sudden, what happened to me, though, you know, my mouth is flapping, and I'm talking, and God's speaking in, into my head, and I realized my frustration, my anger, my everything was all about me. It had nothing to do with him. Now, it wasn't cool that he was cartwheeling through the meeting. Like, there's, you know, things we need to talk about. But, uh, but the reality was my, my embarrassment was more about me than it had, had anything to do with his well-being at all. Does that kind of make sense? So anyway, I don't know why I told you that. Just to let you know what kind of a schmuck I am. So as I'm just sharing, you know, I'm not sharing from any great, you know, attained place or anything. I'm just a friend that's here, and we're just trying to, trying to wrestle with what it means to, to follow Jesus. So this is a great theme. I, 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 I will do anything. I'll sit. I flew to Kathmandu, Nepal once to meet with three people to talk about this stuff. Like, I don't care. I don't, I don't care how many people it is. I'm happy if it's thousands, but I'm happy if it's one. Like, I'm serious. Because this is, this to me, John Wimber used to always say, for those that know uh, that name, the meat's in the street. And I really, really believe that. Not as an outreach, but as an encounter. We're trying to call people into community in L.A. I've got a good friend, Simon Higgs, here with me, who's part of uh, our emerging vineyard church uh, in Los Angeles called Basileia, which is Greek for the kingdom. And I've got a couple vineyard friends here from New Jersey, Reuben and Gwen. So they, they, they've been trying to navigate the L.A. freeways and stuff, but it's just good to have them here. So... Um, we're trying to carve this thing out, and it's, 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 it's hard to call people to this place where entering into something isn't about what I get out of it. It's, what about, it's about what I can release. And I think that's one of the reasons why the poor are so critical to be at the center of Christian community, not an outreach on the side and stuff. We'll probably, you know, look at some of those, those issues a little bit later. But I was uh, in the 
in the living room of someone about three weeks ago, and uh, just the call to community on their hearts has really pulled them. They were living in Woodland Hills. They sold their house. They moved right down into Los Feliz area just to be closer, and just we didn't ask them to anything. They, they got a home that can facilitate some meetings and stuff, and we got into this discussion. He's like, no, you got to tell me about the poor. It's like, I don't get it. Like, I just don't get it. Born and raised in Orange County, was on the staff at the Anaheim Vineyard for a little while. He's just like, you know, like, I totally get helping someone who's helping themselves. I totally get coming alongside the working poor as they're trying to move out of poverty. But I, I just, I'm just really, really wrestling with this whole thing of, of coming alongside of someone who is so broken and shattered, they've fallen to the very bottom rungs of society and culture. One of the things you cannot do if you're really going to address this issue and it impact your heart is you can't make the poor in India and in Africa and in Nepal and in Haiti, and we don't have any poor here in America because our poorest have a whole lot more than anybody over there. I mean, all the stuff that runs through our minds and hearts to kind of insulate ourselves from, I think, what God's really after. That's just my opinion. But um, anyways, really wrestling with this. And without going into the whole elaborate detail, just as we were talking and praying together and stuff, it was like the lights just came on. His face just lit up, and he said, I think I get it now. It's not about them. It's about me changing. I said, now, now we can go somewhere. And the whole paradigm just shifted. Everything shifted. So this is not so much about what we do. This is not so much, even though there is a significant discussion that has to happen about the impact. This is the thing. I'm trying to bring into the discussion, because the issues of justice and mercy are becoming a little bit more cooler to talk about, particularly, I think, because of the impact of the emergent church and people wrestling with postmodernism and stuff. It seems a little more gritty and like we're really doing something to change the world in a legitimate way. We're not just holed up in some religious kind of cloister. Something really attractive about it, both on the non-charismatic side of the church as well as the charismatic side. It's fascinating to see how it kind of comes through. I, had to, I stood in a conference actually just several months ago, and I found myself just yelling, which I kind of talk loud anyway, but that's just me. This is not like anointing or anything like that, so don't worry about it. I just, sitting at the dinner table, I go, would you please pass the salt? I mean, that's just, I mean, I just talk loud, so that's just, that's just the way I am. So, but, uh, but I found myself just kind of screaming. I said, the poor are not a seed. So the whole discussion was about, okay, now the latest way to kind of make our way with God is now we give to the poor. And we forgot about that, and if you sow your seed there, then the blessing of God will come. You see how we do this to ourselves? And we do it to the gospel? This is a journey of the heart. This is not a journey to get any other place than into the face of Jesus and into the place where the Holy Spirit penetrates us in the deepest core of our being and we rest in the arms of the Father and understand who He is, not just what He does. Does that make sense? That's, that's where we're turning our face. And I, that's why this discussion is so critical. I, uh, there's a little book here, The Celtic Way of Evangelism, which I find just a little fascinating read. It's really easy if you want to dig into this, this one a little bit for those of you that like to read. But there's a little quote in a chapter called The Missionary Perspective of Celtic Christianity on page 85. It actually has nothing to do with the poor. But I love this little quote because I think this is what's happening to us. Sometimes the mission context... So most of us want to have some kind of sense of mission, some sense of motion in the church. There's a lot of current talk and babbling going on about what it means to be missional and all of that. You ever heard, heard of that kind of terminology? Well, I love this quote. Sometimes the mission context of the community serves not only as a theater for adapting the presentation of Christianity, so becoming culturally relevant or, you know, impacting the society. Sometimes it's not about that at all. It serves as a catalyst for recovering something essential and precious within Christianity. Does that kind of make sense? 
So this author is saying, as we move out in mission, as we encounter the culture and society around us, especially as it's, as it's motivated by some kind of initiation of the Holy Spirit and an encounter with the heart of God, as we move into there, it's not just about putting something out there, it's recovering something within. And I'm fascinated. It totally makes sense to me that we hear a lot more talk about justice and about the poor and about social issues and about things like that as the church hungers and as those of us that are trying to grapple with what it means to be a follower of Christ, as we move outside of ourselves, this is where we will end up because it's at the very core of the gospel. It really is at the very center. And that's why I want to go to Mark 10, just for some thoughts here. Is there any questions or any, any things that are jumping up? And We've got a small enough group here we can totally facilitate that. Anything you're unclear on or just want to bring an observation to or anything? Or are we cool just keep going? You don't talk in Orange County? Like you don't do that? Okay, all right. Oh, well, we don't do it very well either. <clears throat> So this is a story. It's a true story. It's probably one you've heard many times, but I want to maybe highlight a couple things in it that, that maybe we don't always focus on. I'm not sure, but my guess is that we don't. Um, if you, we look down... Well, let's, go, let's start at verse 15. Jesus is responding to some indignation that's happened because he's allowing children to jump on his head. And the, sort, of the, sort of the assessment is this, God can't let kids jump on him and pull his beard and do things like that. This is inappropriate. And he says, but truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, the, sometimes Jesus says really, really strong stuff. So I'm going to let him say it and just let it drop, and, and you got to go home and figure it out. Whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. I'm in the New American Standard. What's it say in a couple other versions? Oh, okay, that's cool. By no means? All right. So it's pretty, it seems clear, right? Whatever vantage point that the, the uh, translators are coming from, it's, the point's really coming across. You can't get into the kingdom of heaven without being like a child. Any other entrance is no entrance at all. And there's something... The reason I'm starting here is, is because in verse 16, he takes these children in his arms, he begins blessing them, laying his hands out upon them. Now look at verse 17. As Jesus is doing this, somebody bolts out of the crowd, runs out of the crowd, completely loses composure, completely loses self-control, and he runs out of the crowd. Now, the inference of the text would be that this would not be a typical behavior for this man because we'll find out that he's the good old American boy. He's got it all together. He's got the college degree. He's got the beach house. He's got everything together. He's a regular church attender. He probably surfs. He's got, you know, he's got the vehicles. He's got the stuff. He owns the property. He is really, really living it out what it means to be a blessed person. He's upstanding in society. He obeys the law. He's on a track for political recognition. He is moving up the ladder of success, not just in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of the religious community as well. This guy could be president. I mean, really, he is the cream of the crop. Top of his class in college, quarterback on the football team, but nice to everybody. You know, his friends across the spectrum, he is, he is the all-American kid. I mean, this guy is rocking. I mean, amazing. But he loses himself in this moment, and he bolts out of the crowd, 
The text would indicate to us that it's like he comes down like sliding into third base, you know, or sliding in for a home run. I mean, he is getting dirty. He's on the ground, and he's looking up in the face of Jesus, and he says this, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? There's something in the way that Jesus is treating children that pulls so deep inside of him. I don't know what wealth does to families, but it does create certain dynamics. And for this young man, it is very apparent that one of the clearest things, no matter with all the stuff and all the trimmings and all the presents and all the money and all the dough in the bank and all the property that he's inherited, he's, he's lost Childlikeness. Can you see that in the story? Something so breaks him on the inside, the way that Jesus treated children. And then he's got these words ringing in his head. If you don't become like these children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's puzzling to him. So there's kind of a conflict going on. Does this make sense? He's, 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 he's longing for this kingdom thing, and yet there's something so simple and broken deep inside of him that, that, that he's just lost all restraint, and he's, he's got to find out what is going on. He's, it's maybe he's thinking, you know, I've never seen anybody treat kids like this. I wasn't treated like this. My dad loved me, and he looked after me, and, you know, and I'm doing really good, but something is hollow in there. And Jesus... To me, this is one of the most profound words uh, in the Bible. Go, let's just jump down, because if I get stuck in the text, I'll, you know, I'm, I was trained in a Baptist seminary, so I'm like Mr. Exegete dude, you know, like, let's just go through. So I've, I've got to, like, I've got to jump over verses or we'll never get anywhere. So it's like, um, look at verse 21. Looking at him, now, the translation I've got here says, Jesus felt a love for him. The NIV says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. This is really critical to understanding what's happening in the exchange. Jesus is not mad. Jesus is not speaking with a rebuking voice. Jesus is not pointing the big prophetic finger and, you know, about to make some huge statement about what he needs to do with his life. The disciples remember something that happened in the face of Jesus, in the tone of his voice, in the posture of how he responded to this young man, and the way they describe it is Jesus really loved this guy. I mean... He longed for him to be one of his disciples. I mean, it was like, dude, you would be so great on our ministry team. You would be the perfect match for, for what we're building and where we're going, the resource that you can bring to the table, the perspective that you have, the dedication, the passion for God. Because he's just said to Jesus, you know, teacher, I've kept the law. I've, 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 I've done so many things. He's almost like relieved because he said, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know, he lays out several things. And, um, and, and you know the commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery. Don't. He's like, oh man, like I'm on track. Like this is good news, you know. And Jesus looks and goes, oh man, you are so wanting it. You are so wanting it. I love you. You inspire me. You move me. I mean, NASB says that Jesus felt. I mean, this was an emotional response. Isn't this, isn't this wild? So he's not mad. He's not angry. He's not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to beat him up. But he says something that just is so shocking. And I think this is the question of the weekend. One thing you lack. There's only one piece missing. See, because he's, he's really close to the kingdom. He's actually become like one of these little children. He's just, he's just come that short of jumping right into Jesus' lap himself. Uncool. 
but he's there. One thing you lack, just one piece of the puzzle, if it drops into place, I'm telling you, mate, you are in. Not as a test that you have to pass, not as some, you know, effort that you have to do, not some work of righteousness that gets you in, but to step into the heart of what I'm calling you to. You won't be able to walk this journey called Christianity without this peace. And it's the only piece missing. Go, sell all you possess. Now, we're not talking about someone who doesn't have a lot. You know, I say this with all kinds. We're, you know, we're not talking about a, a Y-whammer here, you know, or, or, you know, someone that's, you know, eking it out to be part of the Soul Survivor team. No, I'm just kidding. It's like, you know, we're, we're talking about someone who possesses great wealth materially. Don't try to spiritualize these passages away or, or you'll, you'll miss the heart of God. Go sell everything you possess, give it to the poor, then you'll understand what treasure from heaven is and come and follow me. Now, we know the rest of the story, right? He couldn't do it. He could not do it. As passionate as he was, as desiring of the kingdom of God as he was, as, as moved by Jesus as he was, as captivated by the teachings of Christ that he was, as pulled by the heart and personality of Jesus that he just, I mean, he was just on, he was in the dirt. He was in the middle of the altar call, for goodness sake. He's at the front of the church weeping and crying and, you know, laying out on the, on the front as the worship team is playing. But he couldn't go all the way. We just sang it, didn't we? You know? Uh, what was that lyric? You know, we want it to be more than the song. Something. We couldn't go all the way. And I'll tell you, quite honestly, there's days I don't know if I can go all the way. I, I keep coming back to this place. Some days I have gone all the way. You know, then I got four kids, and then I have a wife, and I have, I mean, so I'm introducing you to a wrestle. You have to understand this. And Keith is inviting you to a, you know, to be messed up your whole life. I mean, that's really, that's really all we're saying. This thing is messed up. But the truth is, the deeper we go and the more that we taste of it, you know, you, it's, it, it gets harder and harder to turn away. The, the questions don't get more unabrasive. You know, the struggles of the heart don't, don't get any deeper. But the taste does get sweeter. It really does. Because there's more, see this, and I, I love that if you read Keith's blogs, he was unpacking some of this some time ago in one of his blogs. And I just, I love when discussion goes this way. It's like, this isn't even about ending poverty. This isn't about, you know, trying to establish some huge justice mission in the earth that's going to like just solve everything. I mean, I, I want to I shoot for that. But this is a journey of the heart. This is what it means to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus did say, and I don't think he was being negative or he was being depressed or he was just speaking, you know, out of doubt when he said, the poor you will always have with you, we could put in parenthesis, this side of heaven. There is a day when every tear will be wiped away, when all pain will be banished forever, when sickness will never touch a body again. When poverty and hunger and famine and AIDS and disease will be banished forever. I mean, this is going to be awesome. But until that day, as we reach for that, we bring into the present reality the power and the impact of, of, of the kingdom of God. But we will touch suffering and pain. We will hold those who are dying in our arms over and over and over again. But there's no life like that life. If you lose your life, you will gain it. We don't believe that. 
We don't believe it. We want that to mean 10% of our income. We want that to mean one year of a mission outreach. We want that to mean so many things. You know what it means? It means you die. Like it really means you die. How do I get there? I don't know. Keith was just telling me a statistic, you know, we're over there in Los Angeles, you're here in Orange County, and, and we have some people here from New York. Top three areas in all of the United States of per capita millionaires. See that little stat on the back there? It's pretty staggering that um, the average amount in Orange County that is given to charity out of all the households is $1.39 a year. It's messed up. Sometimes I get really scared because I actually think Jesus is playing chicken. <laughs> you know, he's coming down the freeway and he is on an absolute head-on collision with the American dream. And the crazy thing, everybody's trying to come here to get it. One thing you lack, just one thing. You got everything else sorted. You're passionate, you pray, you worship, you're dedicated, you serve. You're the first one there and the last one to leave. You're giving, you're kind, you're studious, you're applied, you're disciplined, you're real but one thing you lack. Can you give it all to the poor? Look what Jesus says, and this is why we need to have times like this together. Jesus looking around. So he's like, okay, guys, come here. Just, you know, I just, just like, just, just come a little closer. We'll see him. Now remember we said Jesus loved him. This was not rebuke or anger or anything harsh. This wasn't judgment. He really wanted him to be part of the disciples. He loved this guy. Like, see him walking away? Guys, I got to tell you something. How hard, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Do you know we live in potentially the hardest place in the whole world to be a follower of Jesus? You thought it was India. You thought it was Zimbabwe. You thought it was Iraq. You thought it was Kathmandu, Nepal. It's Newport Beach, California. People are coming to Christ in numbers that are staggering today in other parts of the world. I mean, the exponential growth of the community of faith and the followers of Jesus internationally is its mind-blowing right now. I mean, if I pulled out mission statistics right now, your head would be reeling. There are more followers of Jesus Christ on the planet currently than there has been in all of Christian history up till now. Most of them are in poverty. Most of them are under persecution. I just got an email yesterday from our good friends in Kathmandu. We've church planted over there and have walked in friendship for over 10 years now. I mean, several in the church were starving. We sent over some money from Basilea to kind of get them out of a pinch. And, and uh, the king just lost his mind. The city was in complete curfew for 19 days. Riots were going on in the streets. If you couldn't leave your house before 8 in the morning and you had to be in by 6 at night or you were shot on sight. They're coming to Christ like in the droves. Why? Because they got it easy. I haven't seen a Christian bumper sticker made of this one yet, but James said, the poor of the earth 
And he's a good pastor because he knew the whole congregation immediately would be spiritualizing it. Well, Bill Gates is poor too. You know, he's poor in his heart. Someone has to reach them, brother. Don't you know that? How many times have I had that at the end of one of these meetings? And I agree with that. Like, I totally agree. This isn't even about that. This is about the heart of the kingdom and the heart of the gospel. I lost my train of thought there. Where, where was I going? <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah. James says, the poor of the earth, and then he puts in parentheses, in the eyes of the world, so that the church can't spiritualize it away. I mean, who are poor in the eyes of the world? They're the poor. They're the people all over these statistics, you know. Man, I just wanted to go and take a for goodness sake, and I turn around, and Keith Giles has got some statistic on the bathroom wall. I can't escape it. <laughs> but good on you, Keith. Like you're sticking it in our face, man. I just wanted to take a dump, and I'm still confronted. It's like... 80% of the homeless in Orange County are, you know, the working poor or something, or have a job or something. It's like that. I'm like, no, let me out of here. <laughs> but I couldn't go because I wasn't done yet. But anyway, that's a whole other story. I won't go there. But So James says, the poor in the eyes of the world. You want to know who the poor are in the eyes of the world, just go on the Internet and find out who they are in Orange County. We have poor in Orange County. We have the poor in Los Angeles. We're now passing laws that is making it illegal to sleep on the street. How did they get there? How, you know, it's, it's just, it, it, in the kingdom, that stuff doesn't matter. Because if it mattered, we'd all be dead. One of the only differences between the poor in the eyes of the world and the rich in the eyes of the world is material insulation. I have a bad day, I go shopping. Someone on the streets has a bad day, you know, they're shooting up or they're, you know, it, you can't, here's just another little aside, I'm finding internationally, it, you cannot pursue the poor and not wrestle with what it means to be addicted. But again, that's where the poor are such a gift to the rest of us because they show us what our addictions are. We started a, an addict recovery house. I'll wrap this up really quick because I got tonight too. Uh, we started an addict recovery house in the city we were at before L.A., and it was such a fun experience. We took this place, and we made it the nicest house on the block, and we had, uh, where we lived there, we had the highest number per capita in all of North America of glue sniffers. Most of them were Native American, but uh, there was a significant amount other. I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, glue would be oozing out of their pores. One time a guy came into the church and we were totally into the, the, the Advent thing. We had candles like burning everywhere. The guy walks by the candelabra. I mean, he's just walking by and he lights on fire. I'm not kidding. It was one of the craziest services we ever had. I mean, he's on fire. The fumes are on fire. Half our staff jumps off the front row, you know, he's going to put the fire out, and he's, in, he's from the street, so he goes into, what the, ha, ha, you know, we're having like this, we're having this street brawl, and there's burning glue, and it just stinks, and there's smoke, and I'm like, you know, and the Virgin Mary, you know, conceived a son, it was just like, oh man, this is just crazy, but anyway, the poor in the eyes of the world, James says, are the chosen, are the chosen of the earth. I haven't seen that on any book. <laughs> no bumper sticker. In fact, what do we call ourselves here? I've heard more times than not. I'm a Canadian, but I've been here almost four years now. Lived in Kansas City for a short stint in the 90s. America, the chosen nation. And maybe we are. I don't know. It's all up to God. But how, how do we define that? We seem to define it by, in ways that Jesus doesn't define it. So that's just the wrestle, right? Have we redefined Christianity? I think Paul uh, took a course, he was telling me last year, just, you know, about like the first few hundred years of church history. I mean, the poor were just the center of Christian community. I mean, it was the whole deal. In fact, I think the literature tells us in historic, historical documentation, it's like 
100% of like offerings that were taken in the life and fabric of the church for several hundred years in our initial history, 100% of it went to the poor. 100%. How did Christian community survive? Wasn't through offerings, it was through sharing. And that's a tough pill to swallow in LA. How do we share? See, we haven't been taught to share. We've been taught to get our own property, to get our own place, to get our own house, to get our own stuff. And is that all bad? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I go back and forth every day. (laughs) But I think if we let that be our mark of success, we will miss the kingdom of heaven. That can't be the target. Lots of books will tell us it should be. Lots of preachers will proclaim that it is. But I'm, I, I'm really suspect of that theology. Because it doesn't sound like Jesus. What do we sing again? Uh, chose, chose to serve and not to be served. What is that? Who is this guy? Nobody's going to believe this message. You're not going to want to believe this report. Here he comes. You want to be like him? You want to be like him? A man of sorrows? Why would he be a man of sorrows? Not because he had a hard life. could be part of it. It's because he carried the sorrow of those around him. Not afraid to identify with pain and suffering and social injustice. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, okay, guys, let's just bring it down another level. He says, now children, which hooks this whole teaching back to the initial teaching of you have to become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is simple faith. You try to complicate this message, I guarantee you, you will lose it. You try to intellectualize this, theorize it. You try to, like, you know, do all that kind of stuff to it. And there's, there's absolute, like, philosophical and I mean, intellectual sparring that needs to go on in this arena. But I'm telling you, if you don't become like a child, you will lose the message of the poor and justice. Because you'll make it about everything that it's not all about. Don't complicate this, Jesus says. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter this kingdom. Then they're even more astonished, and they say, we're screwed. (laughs) That's the original Greek. Then who can be saved? Jesus says, well, with people, this is impossible. But with God, everything's possible. Isn't it fascinating how we make that verse about getting stuff? And the point of the verse is to get rid of all your stuff. I can't believe what we do to the Bible. How many times have you heard that verse quoted about, like, getting something. Oh, oh, brother, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Hallelujah. Speedboat. You know, it's like... (laughs) With man it, what is it? What is this? Letting go of everything material, giving it to the poor, and following Christ. But here's the good news. With God... Even this is possible. 